I mean, people like Stu Hameroff and folks yeah. like that. Um, but if if the if brains did were quantum objects, I mean, ultimately they are. But if they behaved as quantum objects, then uh, it it opens the possibility that uh, that our brains are connected with everything. They're entangled with everything. In which case, we, we can think of psychic phenomena not as a mysterious process of sending information from out there and somehow getting into your head, but more that an experience of, of a psychic or mystical state is a change of attention within the brain. You see? If the whole universe is already inside your head, because you're bio-entangled with it, then if you wish to see what is in somebody else's head or what's in a hidden um, envelope somewhere else, or what's on the other side of the world right now, or last year. You simply need to attend to the portion of your brain that is entangled with that state. And if it's all entangled altogether, it changes the nature of the problem from some uh, external signal-passing model into an attentional model. Mm -hmm. The reason why this is kind of interesting is because all of the evidence we know of is, says that attentional training is the way to improve psychic awareness and mystical awareness. Uh-huh. I mean, what is, what's meditation? It's a form of attention training. Mm-hmm. It's a form of attentional training at deep levels of the mind. Deep meaning away from um, paying attention to sensory input. And if that same attentional ability can hear your name called in a cocktail party, where it's very noisy, and you imagine that your brain is extremely noisy because it has the whole universe in it, that somebody who has trained their attention, and by the way, I'm speaking as though attention is something you have, and I'm not so sure that it's, I I don't know how to talk about it in other terms, but let's assume that it's something that you can have. If you're very good at attention, you would be able to train your attention to pick up virtually anything that you're interested in. From that point on, the processing of the information, uh, the way you report it, whether you remember it, all the rest of it is neuroscience and psychology. Right. And there's an enormous amount of evidence that the experiences that people talk about as psychic and mystical are modulated by neuroscience and psychology. Mm -hmm. So it takes the, the first and most difficult issue, namely the physics of it, and, and in a sense finesses the physics problem because it's no longer a signal transfer problem. So in other words, in other words, we don't need a to try to identify the location of the sixth sense as a, as a, some sort of input. Where's the input coming in? How is this right. information getting into the brain? Because you're saying it's already there. It's already there. Yeah, this is not a new idea, by the way. Okay. This, this, can, this goes way, way back. And in, in, uh, I think one of the first that I know was articulated. It was Henri Bergson in the 1800s, hmm. where he viewed the brain as a, uh, as a filter for consciousness. In other words, that you, like you have access to an enormous amount of stuff, and the brain is like a stopping valve or a, a shrinkage valve to prevent you from being overwhelmed with everything there is. And the same general idea is talked about by William James and a bunch of people since then, hmm. that that the, a large chunk of the of the brain in processing takes this enormous amount of stuff coming in and and filters it and preprocesses it and by the time it reaches conscious awareness there's practically nothing left it's this tiny little trickle and if you take a psychedelic drug or you meditate a lot you you know you get more of it you can sense a lot more of what's out there um, and that's only talking about sensory input so you can imagine if indeed we were connected some deeply inside somewhere, uh, that that is going to be really tapped down because that it would act as an enormous amount of noise and you'd never be able to do anything. Mm. So just to get this theoretical model, so, so what is consciousness or conscious awareness then in this sense? It's, it's a brain function then? Uh, it's Conscious awareness, uh, of course, nobody has any idea. <laughs> I can imagine that because of the advances in neuroscience and, and the finding of 
specific circuitry in the brain that is associated with different thoughts and different feelings um, and are, are just beginnings, the kind of inklings of the complexity of what is actually going on in the brain yeah. and what happens when brain damage occurs. All those independent things taken together does suggest that a lot of what we think of as consciousness, conscious awareness, unconsciousness, all of that, is a function of the brain itself. Mm-hmm. What I'm proposing then, though, is that, that, that the whole ball of wax cannot be accounted for in classical terms. So, on this, do you think there is something like a non-physical mind or, a, or consciousness independent of the brain? Is, it, is such a thing still... No, no, I don't think so. You don't think I so? Think, I think to okay. say that something is non-physical um, may be a, a, what a philosopher would call a category mistake. We're, we're def- redefining what physical means or expanding our understanding of the physical? Yes. Okay. Hmm. Why would they say it's a category mistake? Because it, it's uh, starting with an assumption that may not be true. Okay. Like, what, what could non-physical mean? I mean, it, it, as soon as you ask the questions, which are the classical questions of dualism, uh, it, it, in a sense, it kind of begs the question. We know an enormous amount of what physicality is like. We know basically nothing about what non-physical is like. Right. The only thing that we have is our own internal subjective experience of something which is sort of non-physical, but it, it does beg the question because we have no idea what awareness, where it comes from or how it works. Mm-hmm. I so, think the, 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 kind of, the question comes from the sense that whatever this conscious, aware, subjective experience is, there's some dimension of it that doesn't seem very physical. It doesn't seem physical. Well, but right. But it doesn't seem to, to line up with other things that we look at and say, oh, that's physical. I can touch it. I can hit it. I can right. but, but point the same to token, it. Uh, w- w- is, uh, is electricity physical? Is like the sensing of an electrostatic field. Mm. Is that physical? Mm. Um, you know, it, it, the right, nature right, right. of physicality is... Uh, is, cha- is not even so clear within classical physics, but when you get into the quantum world, uh, then you have to start talking about virtual states, probabilistic states, mm-hmm. things that don't have any form of reality as the way that we experience it in, in common sense terms. Mm-hmm. And even in, in common sense terms, the germ theory of disease doesn't make any sense. You can't see a germ. You know, if, if we didn't have special tools and ways of extending our ordinary senses we'd have we still have no reason to believe that that there's a germ and a dna that's ridiculous I've, how can you have something so small that is so important <laughs> right. so that's in the same token that uh yes by the time we get up to the uh, classical physical reality we we can ignore for the most part things like germs and dna and quanta and yet even really, really tiny things uh, are at the base of all of the rest of it. And the more we learn about those little, little tiny things, the more important we see that they are. Okay, I just have a couple more questions. Um, so how does, how does this theory you're developing square with, say, uh, Sheldrake's theory of field, his field theory? Because he's, he's pretty fired up about the idea that fields explains all these things. I haven't heard you really talking about fields. Is, is this a, a completely different way of thinking about it, or does it, does it jibe with that way of thinking about it? Um, what, so I, I, I'm not sure that this is compatible or incompatible. It's, okay. It probably is compatible, and then I, I'm, I'm talking about something, I mean, I'm really focusing more on how is it possible to be aware of anything anywhere at any time. That's not quite the same as, as the question which is asked by the morphogenetic field idea. Okay. So it may or may not ultimately fit together. Yeah, I would say it's not incompatible, but I'm also not sure it's asking the same question, so it, it's not directly comparable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess I, because I'm, I'm trying to focus more on a general theory of psi, right. a general theory of mystical awareness, um, 
in a sense, it doesn't really matter which one is primary. Mm. Mm-hmm. Uh, some people will say that the evidence for survival after death and out of body states and near death states suggests that consciousness really does have an independent existence. But I, I think uh, I agree with a number of my colleagues who say that we really can't we can't strongly say that yet because all of that evidence that we know, the ones I just yeah. mentioned, come out of people who are already alive. They come through mediums, they come through personal experiences, they come out of the living. Yes. And if the living has access to the universe in your head, then you can come up with uh, all kinds of interesting stories. 